Chapter twenty two of Bob's A Girl Detective. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bob's A Girl Detective by Grace May North. Chapter twenty two A Case for Two. As Bob's left the small shop, she glanced at her watch, and finding that it was nearly four, she hastened her steps, recalling that that was the hour when she might expect a call from the young lawyer. As she turned the corner at the East River, she saw a small, smart-looking auto driving up at the curb in front of the Pensinger mansion, and from it leaped a fashionably groomed young man. Truly an unusual sight in that part of New York's east side, where the clothes, ill-fitting even at best, descended from father to son, often made smaller by merely haggling off at arm and ankle. No wonder that Ralph Cadwaller Corey was the object of many admiring glances from the dark eyes of the young Hungarian women who, with gaily-coloured shawls over their heads at the moment, were passing on their way to the tobacco factory. But Ralph was quite unconscious of the scrutiny, for, having seen Bob's approaching, he hastened to meet her, hat in hand, his good-looking, clean-shaven face glowing with anticipation. "'Have you found a clue as yet, Miss Vandergrift?' he asked eagerly, when greetings had been exchanged. Roberta laughed. "'No, and I'll have to confess that I haven't given the matter a moment's thought since we parted three hours ago. Is that all it's been? To me it had seemed three centuries. The boy said this so sincerely that Roberta believed that he must be greatly interested in the Pensinger mystery. It did not enter her remotest thought that he might also be interested in her. Having reached the mansion, Bobs led the way up the wide stone steps, saying, I do hope Gloria and Lena may at home. I want my sisters to meet you. But no one was to be seen. Gwen was still in her room while the other girls had not returned from the settlement house. "'Well, there's another time coming,' Bobs flashed her smile at her companion, then led the way to the wide fireplace, where comfortable chairs awaited them, and they seated themselves facing the still-burning embers. "'I say, Miss Vandergrift,' Ralph began, "'you're a girl, and ought to know better than I just what another girl, even though she lived seventy-five years ago, would do under the circumstances with which we are both familiar.' If you loved a man, of whom your mother did not approve, would you really drown yourself, or would you marry him and permit your parents to believe that you were dead? Bob sat so long gazing into the fire that the lad, earnestly watching her, wondered at her deep thought. At last she spoke. I couldn't have hurt my mother that way, she said, and there were tears in the hazel eyes that were lifted to her companion. I would have known that her dearest desire would be for my ultimate happiness. But mothers are different, we will have to confess, the lad declared. Marilyn's may have thought only of social fitness. Then, as he glanced about the old saloon, and up at the huge crystal chandeliers, he added, I judge that the Pensingers were people of great wealth in those early days, and probably leaders in society. I believe that they were, Roberta agreed, but my mother had a different standard. She believed that the mental and soul companionship should be a big thing in the marriage, and for that matter, so do I. Ralph felt awed. This was a very different girl from the hoydenish young would-be detective with whom he had had so brief an acquaintance. "'Miss Vandergrift,' he said impulsively, "'I wish that I had a sister like you. I wouldn't my mother be pleased, though, if you were her daughter. A girl, I am sure, would have been more comfort and companion to her when my brother Desmond died.' Then he added, after a moment of silence, "'I can get your point of view all right. I wouldn't break my mother's heart by pretending to drown myself, not even if the heavens fell.' "'I'd like to know your mother,' Roberta said. "'She must be a wonderful woman.' "'She is,' the lad declared. "'I want you to meet her as soon as she returns. "'Just now she is touring the West with friends. "'But to get back to Marilyn Pensinger. "'From the little that we know of her family, "'I conclude that her mother was a snob "'and placed social distinction above her daughter's happiness. "'But the very fact that her father made his will as he did "'proves, doesn't it, that he loved his daughter more sincerely.' He did not cut her off with a shilling when he believed that she had eloped with a foreign musician. Instead, he arranged so that a descendant of that Hungarian, whose name we do not even know, would inherit all that Mr. Pensinger possessed. But this isn't getting us anywhere. Do you happen to know anyone who has recently come over from Hungary? Bob smiled. Wouldn't that be grasping at straws? Maybe, but do you? Roberta thought a moment, then looked up brightly. I believe I do. At least I know a Hungarian. His name is Mr. Hardinian, and he is doing social welfare work. He speaks perfect English, however, and may have been born in this country. I suppose we go over to his clubhouse and interview him? Then, as she rose, she added, You will like Mr. Hardinian. He has such beautiful eyes. 
Ralph laughed also as he rose. "'Is that a girl's reason for liking a man?' he inquired. Then he added, "'Would I were a Hungarian that I might have interesting eyes? As it is, mine are the plain, unromantic, American variety.' Roberta smiled at her new friend, but what she said showed that her thought was far from the subject. "'Before we go, I want to be sure that my sister Gwen is comfortable.' Gwendolyn was sleeping so quietly that Roberta believed that she would not awaken before Lena May's return, and so, beckoning the lad to follow, she left the house, closing the door softly. Ralph turned and looked back at the upper windows of the rooms that were not occupied as he inquired, "'Do you have a hunch that the old mansion holds the clue we are seeking?' Roberta's reply was, "'Only the ghost of Marilyn knows.' When the two partner detectives were in the small luxurious car and going very slowly because of the congested traffic down First Avenue, Ralph said, "'Tell me a little about your sisters and yourself that I might feel better acquainted.' And so, briefly, Roberta told the story of their coming to the East Side to live. "'I say, Miss Vandergrift, that certainly was hard luck losing the fine old place which your family had supposed was its own for so many generations.' Then the lad added, with sincere admiration, "'You girls certainly are trumps. I'm mighty glad I met you, and hope you'll be glad to some day.' "'Why, Mr. Cadwalla Corey, I'm glad right this very moment,' Roberta assured him in so an impersonal manner that the lad did not feel very greatly flattered. Indeed, he was rather pleased that this was so. Being the son of a famous judge possessed of good looks, charming manners, and all the money he wished to spend— Ralph had been greatly sought after by fond mothers of the girls in his set, if not by the maidens himself, and it seemed rather an interesting change to meet a girl whose interest in him was not personal. After a silent moment in which the lad's entire attention had been centred on extricating his small auto from a crush of trucks, vegetable-laden push-carts, and foreign pedestrians, he turned and smiled at his companion. "'Let's turn over to Central Park now,' he suggested. "'It's a little roundabout, I'll agree, but it'll be a pleasanter riding.' It was decidedly out of their way, but a glance at her wrist watch assured Roberta that Lena May would have returned to be with Gwen by that time, so she was in no especial hurry. How beautiful the park seemed, after the thronged, noisy east side with its mingled odours from tobacco, fish markets, and general squalor. "'There, now we can talk,' Ralph said, as he drove slowly along one of the winding avenues under a canopy formed by wide-spreading trees. "'What shall it be about?' "'You,' Roberta replied. "'Tell me about yourself.' "'There isn't much to tell,' the lad began. "'My brother Desmond and I grew up in a happy home. "'During the winter months we attended a boys' school up the Hudson, "'and each summer vacation we travelled with our parents. "'We have been about everywhere, I do believe. "'Desmond and I were all in all to each other. "'We were twins. "'Perhaps that is why we seem to love each other "'even more than brothers usually do. "'I did not feel the need of any other boy companion, "'and when we at last entered college "'we were permitted to be roommates.' In our sophomore year, Desmond died, and I didn't much care what happened after that. It seemed as though I could never room with another chap, but at last the dormitories were so crowded that I had to take a fellow in. That was two years ago, and today Dick Delaney is as close to me as Desmond was, almost not quite, of course. No one would ever be that, but I tell you, Miss Vandergrift, Dick is a fine chap, clear through to the core. I'd bank on Dick's doing the honourable thing, come what might. I'm a year older than he is, and he won't finish until June, but then he's coming on here to little old New York and spend a month with me. I say, Miss Vandergrift, I'd like to have you meet him. Roberta smiled. I've been waiting for you to come to a period that I might tell you that Dick Delaney and I were playmates when we wore pinafores. You see, they were our next-door neighbours. Bob said this in so matter-of-fact tone that Ralph did not think for one moment that this could be the girl his pal had once told him that he loved and hoped to win. If only Ralph had realised this, much so might have been saved for one of them. End of chapter 22